Good morning. Welcome back again for the second day. There's two days left, so courage. <laughs> Thank you for being here early in the morning. Sorry for the little delay. So I'm not going to take more time to introduce the conference. I hope you enjoyed uh, uh, yesterday. So it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Mr. Smith. He's senior director at Blaine Southern since January 2019 and also visiting professor of cultural history at Queen Mary University in London, honorary fellow of Chris College in Cambridge and a trustee of the Garden Museum. He's also been secretary and chief executive of the Royal Academy of Arts from 2007. He will be speaking about the Royal Academy of Arts, a case study in renovation. Thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you all for coming this early. I, I should say and make clear that the abstract is somebody else's abstract. I'm speaking only about the Royal Academy. Everything it says in the abstract, I think, belongs to somebody who spoke yesterday afternoon. So you have no record of what I'm going to say. Uh, I thought that what I could most usefully do is to talk through some of the issues that rose during the planning and design of the Royal Academy of Arts new building, just to its north in Burlington Gardens, which opened in May last year, and where I was very closely involved in all aspects of its planning during nearly the entire time that I was the secretary and chief executive of the Academy, only standing down uh, just recently at the end of December last year, when I moved, as has been said, to being director of a contemporary art gallery, Blaine Southern. Now, of course, I'm aware that an academy is not exactly the same as a museum, since the Royal Academy in London is much more concerned with exhibitions than it is with its permanent collection much more actively involved with the teaching of art to its postgraduate students than it is purely as in a museum with the display and interpretation of art. And the Academy is and always has been a private institution. It's under the direct patronage of the Crown, but not funded by the Crown, except for a brief period under George III. It's a public institution under the auspices, it's not a public institution under the auspices of the government. On the other hand, to most visitors, I think the Academy looks and feels like, and indeed is, a public art institution, open to visitors, showing art, and with public and charitable responsibilities. I'm treating it as a case study of what constitutes a modern museum and what the conceptual issues were which lay behind its recent public expansion and architectural development. Now, at the time I joined the Academy in September 2007, was essentially three things, only one of which was really evident to the public. What it was known for, and still is, is mounting major international exhibitions. It's had a long history of being the most important exhibition venue in London, stretching back to at least the 1920s, when it started mounting survey exhibitions of international art in its large-scale exhibition galleries beginning, as it happens, with an exhibition of Spanish paintings from November 1920 to January 1921. 1923, it held a bicentenary exhibition of the work of its first president, Sir Joshua Reynolds, and an exhibition of Australian art organized by the Society of Artists in Sydney. 1926, it did a retrospective exhibition of the work of John Singer and the Sergeant, who had been elected as an associate of the Royal Academy in 1894 full member in uh, 1897. The best known of its big early exhibitions was its exhibition of Italian art held between 1st of January and 20th of March 1930. Mainly uh, known because of the involvement of Kenneth Clark as its curator before he became director of the National Gallery and because it involved the close collaboration of Mussolini's government and its organisation. What you need to know is that by 1930, the Academy had already become known as a venue for major international exhibitions, at least as much for its annual summer exhibition. It was, and to an extent still is, London's major Kunsthalle, equivalent to the Grand Palais 
Uh, that's the Italian art expression. Here's the Grand Palais in Paris, constructed in 1900, or the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels, or the Haus der Kunst in Munich. During the 10 years before I became secretary, the Academy had done major exhibitions such as Sensation, which ran from 18th September to 28th December 1997, showing the work of the so-called YBAs from the collection of Charles Saatchi. It attracted over 300,000 visitors and was deeply controversial. In 2000, we did a big survey exhibition, 1900 out of the crossroads. 2006, it did a big exhibition China, the Three Emperors, 1662 to 1795, opened by the Queen and the then President of the People's Republic of China. There was no doubt that the Academy was very successful simply as an exhibition venue. It attracted substantial press to its exhibitions, large visitor numbers, normally between 200,000 and 300,000. But I think that there were beginning to be problems in such a narrow definition of the functions of an art institution. First, and most obviously, the demands and expectations of visitors had changed. <clears throat> visitors to museums and galleries all over the world are now much more demanding of the general visitor experience. They expect not just to visit an exhibition, but they want to go to a cafe, a restaurant, buy souvenirs, of the exhibition, meet friends, talk about the exhibition, buy a book. They don't any longer come just as passive consumers, but as active participants who want to think and learn, be stimulated, have an experience, and participate. You cannot any longer think of the experience of an exhibition as just standing in a queue, buying a ticket, then meekly going around looking at the exhibits as if in a religious shrine people want to learn about what they're looking at and respond to it, if only on social media. The second problem with treating the Academy just as an exhibition venue is that it buried or neglected two of its other founding purposes. The first of these is that it was established to be an art school, it still is one of the leading British art schools, though very small, only accepting 17 students a year. This was pretty well invisible to the public since the exhibitions were in our upstairs and the art schools down in the basement below. <clears throat> the second function of the Academy, which was fairly invisible, is that it's a representative institution of most of the best known contemporary artists and architects. It looked and felt as if it was simply an institution of art history when the artists who run the Academy want it to be an institution celebrating contemporary art practice. So, questions I faced when I arrived were, first, how to reflect the changing expectations of visitors as to what an art institution should be. Secondly, how to make sure that the experience of visitors matches the core function and mission of the institution as a whole. Most especially, that it should be concerned with contemporary art practice, not just its history. Luckily, there was a way of solving these problems because the Academy had in 2001 bought the building immediately north of it, which had previously been designed as the headquarters of the University of London and been used most recently as a museum of mankind. It used to house the British Museum's ethnographic collections and ethnographic exhibitions. So the question was, how best to make use of it? What should be the priorities in making additions to an existing, well-established art institution? In early 2008, we held an architectural competition inviting six well-known architects to compete, including David Chipfield, who had then recently been elected as the Royal Academician. It was, as I recall it, a fairly loose brief encouraging the architects to look at the potential of the building in an adventurous way, imagining how best to adapt it for the benefit of the public. The competition was won by Chipperfield, who had looked closely at the original ground plan drawn up by the mid-Victorian architect James Penethorne. We had wanted there to be a public lecture theatre, 
which had originally been planned to be in the basement. Chipperfield suggested that we reinstate the original space on the east side of the building as a public lecture theatre, creating a modern form of an ancient lecture theatre, hemispherical in shape, like a Greek or Renaissance amphitheatre. In Victorian times, it had been designed as a low-deck amphitheatre in an enormous high ceiling space. Chipperfield proposed a steeply raked amphitheatre set inside the overall available envelope. He and we were always quite explicit that the idea of this lecture theatre was that it should be a modern version of an academic lecture theatre, a place of public debate where people could learn about art, discuss it, see films and attend conferences. It was a way of making audiences think of an art institution as a place to learn about art, not just passively enjoy it. I personally think it works well as a combination of an intimate and a grand space where the audience is psychologically close to the speaker on leather benches rather than cinema style seat, a symbol of intellectual involvement as opposed to passive response. The second aspect of the project, which was pretty well there from the beginning, was to add an extra run of exhibition galleries at the back of the building in space which on the original ground plan were described as examination rooms or laboratories. So far as I was concerned, the hope was that these galleries would allow us to do slightly more experimental exhibitions of contemporary artists, including work either by or chosen by Royal Academicians. This has broadly proved to be the case. There was an opening exhibition devoted to the work of Tester Dean. There was a second very successful exhibition on the work of Renzo Piano, now an honorary RA. They've recently opened an exhibition by Philo de Barlow. Conceptually, the idea for this space was that it should show the art of the present, not of the past. We had a great deal of discussion, if not argument, as to whether or not to keep the original form of the two main galleries with their high Victorian spaces and metal cross beams. The exhibition staff and the engineers wanted us to customize the space so that it was easier to control the environmental conditions to make the spaces into conventional white box galleries. We decided to keep the original form of the architecture to give a sense that these were once examination halls with a history to the spaces against which the artist could, if necessary, compete. The idea was that everywhere in the new building, there should be a sense of its history. The third big space in the new building was devoted to the display of the early history of the Royal Academy's permanent collection. This is the space which is most akin to a permanent museum gallery. The Royal Academy owns the Taddeo Tondo, one of the great works of Renaissance sculpture, acquired by the 19th century artist and collector, Sir George Beaumont, in Rome in 1822, bequeathed to the Royal Academy in his will. Again, there was much discussion as to whether or not to display the tondo in isolation, as it had been in the past, or in conjunction with other works of art. The deciding factor was seeing it displayed in the exhibition held at the National Gallery on the work of Michelangelo and Sebastiano, where it was immensely enhanced by being seen in relation to other works of art. Alongside it, we hung two early copies of work by the other greatest artists of the Renaissance. Early copy of Leonardo's Last Supper, copies made by James Thornhill of Raphael's cartoons. The gallery was and is not just a way of showing major works of art owned by the Royal Academy, but at the same time, giving the visitor a sense of the history of the institution, where it comes from, its founder members, what works of art inspired its teaching. In a way, it's a homage to the spirit of Sir Joshua Reynolds, the first president of the Royal Academy, whose portrait hangs at one end of the gallery. Current uh, hang was overseen by the current president, Christopher Lebrun, whose portrait also hangs just outside the space. So far, most of what I've shown is relatively conventional, what you would expect to find in many museums and galleries. Lecture theatres are not unusual in museums, nor are contemporary art galleries. 
The collections gallery is fairly conservative in the way that it shows works of art, designed by Adrien Gardin, who was responsible for the displays in the Louvre in Lens. The next aspect of what we did was probably less conventional. After about a year, David Chipperfield, the architect, said that Burlington Gardens would never work conceptually as part of the Royal Academy as a whole, unless or until we found a way of connecting the two buildings. The original Royal Academy building facing uh, onto a courtyard to the south, and the old University of London building facing Burlington Gardens to the north, the top third of the, the ground plan. I had forbidden any of the architects involved in the original competition to pay attention to how the two buildings might be connected, knowing that it had been the undoing of some of the previous schemes. The problem was that a public route connecting Burlington Gardens to the main building would inevitably run through the Royal Academy schools, thereby disrupting the integrity of the original ground floor plan of the schools, which runs east-west across the site at basement level. The schools were known to be protective of the privacy of their space. Their view was, and to an extent still is, that the students want to be able to concentrate on their work without the noise and disruption from the school being on a main public route through the building. As they put it, they didn't want to be treated like animals in a zoo. But David Chipperfield was determined to talk to the then keeper, Maurice Cockrell, and he and Christopher LeBron, before he was president, persuaded Maurice that it would be to the benefit of the schools to be more publicly visible, that it would be beneficial to the public to have a sense of the practice of art as represented by the work of the students, thereby interweaving the experience of contemporary art with its history. Chipperfield designed a bridge which would cross over the yard between the two buildings and then drop down into the space previously occupied by two of the students' studios. We kept this space relatively rough and I noticed that the public likes the fact that the exhibitions in the space are much more provisional, more experimental, and the work of students, not established artists. At some point, I remember David Chipperfield saying that when he had worked on the master plans for American museums, I think he was probably referring to the work he did at the St. Louis Art Museum, he was always encouraging the curators to think about art in terms of its origins in practice. The presence of an art school as part of the experience of the visitor integrates product and practice, old art and new, the finished and the experimental. Now, the purpose of my talking about the new wing of the Royal Academy is not just to describe what it is, which you can perfectly well see for yourself next time you're in London but to provide a set of reflections on what it means for the nature of museums and the way that the public experience them. So I'm going to end my talk with a few brief, more general reflections on how the design of the Royal Academy's new building relates to some more general issues surrounding the nature of museum experience. I hope that it will be obvious from everything that I've said that the idea of the new building is to provide a much more complex experience for the visitor than just a pure set of exhibition galleries. The visitor is encouraged to linger and to explore, to find the new spaces, to walk through the building and to enjoy its public spaces, to go to a lecture, have a cup of coffee, act as a 21st century flaneur. I would like to think that the new building treats visitors as grown-up, sophisticated consumers capable of making choices between what to see and enjoy. I like museum design, which is non-prescriptive, generous in the ways in which it allows and encourages visitors to move through and explore it, including a view out into a garden courtyard. It's taking time for visitors to learn their way around the building, to become familiar with it, but I quite like this aspect of it, that it does not yield up its secrets too straightforwardly. 
I think this is the message that I would like to leave from this talk, that museums can be over-didactic. Consumers nowadays are highly sophisticated in the ways in which they read and consume architectural and design messages. They don't necessarily want spaces to be too obvious, but like the idea of architectural exploration and even possibly an element of uncertainty. We can tease visitors as well as teach them. They like complexity and differentiation in the ways in which they experience art so that they can mold their own experience as to how they use a museum rather than having it thrust upon them. If the museum is to be treated as a space of knowledge, then the nature of consumption should have elements of the random and the exploratory, different layers of experience in which the building and its history are themselves amongst the most important artifacts that visitors are expected to consume and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. I would like, good morning everybody. I would like first of all uh, thank the uh, organizers for the uh, invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I will speak in English, but after your excellent British accent, I don't even know how can I speak in English, but I will try to. Obviously, you understand English is far from being my native language. I live and work in, uh, in France, but uh, I am Greek. So I will speak. I, I, I would like just to introduce you to oh, the sorry, public. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, sorry. I really see you're willing to sh to share your experience, and we're willing to sorry. hear you. <laughs> just two minutes, no Please more. Yes, do. <laughs> <laughs> so, Professor Maria Gravari Barba, she's vice provost for international relations in Paris, Ant, Panthéon Sorbonne University. She's also director of the IRIS research team dedicated to tourism studies with main focus on cultural heritage development, urban tourism evolutions. She's, she was also director of the Institute of Research and High Studies on Tourism on the same university, Paris 1. And she's the director of the UNESCO chair at this university and coordinator of the UNITWIN network, Tourism, Culture and Development. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So I will speak about a much more, I would say, urban approach of, of museums, uh, and specifically about the Lower East Side uh, Museum in New York, uh, which was inaugurated in 1988 at 97 Orchard Street at the Lower East Side, a new museum, the Tenement Museum. The tenements are dwellings uh, built um, starting from the 18th century and all through the 19th century to host the emigrants arriving to New York. Emigrants were hosted in buildings of four to six uh, story high, uh, with in most, most cases four apartments per floor. For more than 100 years, the tenements represented the most affordable housing for all those arriving to New York. The Tenement Museum uh, is due to two um, art historians and also social activists who wanted to create a museum honoring the emigrants uh, in America. And it took precisely place in one of these uh, tenement buildings, which form, in fact, the urban fabric uh, of the uh, Lower East Side uh, neighborhood. The tenements represented the ideal place, in fact, to tell this story of the emigrants who contributed to shape the neighborhood and, of course, beyond the city of New York. The presentation and the museography uh, of those stories of the 19th century immigration could eventually be hosted at any other building related to uh, the American immigration uh, epopee. The added value, uh, precisely, of the 97 uh, Orchard Street was that the building had been walled in 1935 and had since remained inhabited. It was fully closed for 50 years, a kind of uh, time capsule. More than 7,000 7, people uh, were hosted at one of the 20 apartments of the building during the seven decades of uh, its operation, means between 1868 to 1935. 
the story of the lives of the anonymous residents of the tenements was only possible um, to trace by ordinary events, means births, uh, weddings, deaths, more rarely by extraordinary events, means violent accidents or murders. The sources are, of course, the Ellis Island uh, records, the records of the police of New York, or professional albanacs. Among these hundreds or thousands of stories, six families uh, provided the material to create six furnished apartments in which these families spent some years of their life. And today, we can visit the apartment of the Italian family of the Baldizis, uh, which in fact uh, presents uh, their struggle uh, to survive during the Great Depression of 1929. We can visit the family of uh, the apartment of the Gubens family, uh, Jews that came from Germany and settled down in the tenements uh, in 1883. The Levine family apartment, which presents the life of a Jewish family at the turn of the 20th century, at a time during which the neighborhood was the center uh, of manufacturing business and one of the most densely uh, populated areas in, uh, in the city, in New York. Also, the apartment of uh, Moors, Catholic emigrants from Ireland. The story here invites visitors to attend uh, the mourning for uh, a child uh, died in 1968 because of difficult conditions of life and uh, hygiene in the district. So these narrative productions of the different tenement apartments contribute, in fact, to transform an ordinary residential building as there are many others uh, in the area, into, we could say, a semi four, a mini carrier for the immigration. By reinventing, in fact, an ordinary building, the Tenement Museum invented a new kind of museum. But more than that, it offered a different meaning, a typology, the whole typology of buildings, uh, that of the tenements. The institutional recognition of the uh, Lower East Side Museum, which is important, you can have here the main dates of the, uh, different, uh, those different recognitions. It was uh, also accompanied by a genuine popular success. During the first years of its operation, of existence, the, museums, the museum was grown from a simple location running with two volunteers and a budget of less than $75,000 uh, to a major New York City cultural institution with more than 100 staff, consultants, volunteers, and an annual budget of more than $5 million. Uh, the Lower East Side Museum became, in a way, the leader of a new generation of museums in, uh, in New York. It took place, as we said before, legitimately in the very heart of the American immigration area here in Lower East Side. The museum is precisely here. Uh, the Lower East Side is this area between Houston, uh, the Bowery, Manhattan Bridge, and also the East, uh, the East River. It's today one of the most mixed neighborhoods in Manhattan, both from the point of view of its commercial and cultural functions, as well as from the point of view of its residential patterns. Uh, nowadays, visitors can still detect easily this uh, stratification of social and historic, uh, of this social and historic district. We can find, as we can see here, creators, designers, very sharp uh, art shops and galleries, uh, also fashionable bars, um, restaurants and trendy hotels, as well as Jewish shops dating back from the 1920s and 1930s, uh, which still have the same traditional customers for the last uh, half a century, as well as more recent Chinese uh, discounts. Different ethnic groups left their mark on the area, but it's certainly the Jewish community that historically marked uh, the most its identity. Jewish shops were really prosperous uh, in the 19, till the 1980s, Shops, in fact, selling cheap items, clothing, underwear, leather, leather goods, umbrellas, furniture, jewelry, which, in fact, benefited by a monopolistic situation created by then by the blue laws uh, in, uh, in New York, 
which prohibited the opening of New York stores on Sunday in other New York areas. Despite the current decline of the neighborhood, uh, its Jewish heritage is still very visible and still important today. Speaking about decline, I'm speaking about the decline of this kind of, of, of shops. So in this neighborhood, characterized by modest and low-rise residential buildings, the few existing monuments are uh, related to the memories of immigration. They are quite rare, such as uh, the Katz uh, Delicatessen here, which uh, became famous through uh, a, a famous scene shooted here uh, for the film When Harry Meets Sally. Uh, so, rare monuments, uh, but in fact, the tourist interest for this area, the visitors' interest for this area more generally, which is uh, now one of the New York sites and is very well presented in most of the New York, New York guides, is more related to the visit of uh, the monuments built, um, uh, is more related to uh, the memories, in fact, of the uh, emigration. So, uh, the, the museum activities um, developed quickly, as I said before, in this uh, district. In 2002, the Tenement Museum bought the buildings which are located at 91 Orchard Street. The museum is here in this building, 97. So they bought uh, also another building uh, located in 91 Orchard Street and also another one in 262 Broom Street, uh, becoming therefore the owner of three buildings in the same block. In 2000, the museum attendance uh, reached uh, more than 90,000 visitors. The affiliation with Ellis Island and also the Statue of Liberty within the framework of the inscription of the museum on the list of national park uh, landmarks led, in fact, the museum managers to foresee an attendance of more than 200,000 visitors in uh, the years to come. And it is in this context uh, of the rapid increase of the number of visitors that the Lower East Side Museum uh, made in 2001 an attempt to buy also this building here, which is uh, located in 99 Orchard Street. One of the main reasons, in fact, uh, for which uh, the museum would like to purchase uh, the 99 Orchard Street building uh, was to present also the stories of more recent emigrants, those who arrived after uh, 1935, as I said before, the uh, building here at 97, the main building of the museum, was walled after uh, 1934, and no other uh, emigrants were in fact uh, hosted in this building after this date. So the idea was also to present stories from more recent emigration from uh, uh, Puerto Rico or from, uh, from China. But we have a story here which is quite interesting. The owners of 99 Orchard Street refused to sell the building. So an expropriation procedure was set up. Obviously, the use of expropriation uh, requested, in fact, by the museum to the Empire State Development Corporation, which is an agency of the state of New York, involving the displacement of the 15 tenants of the building here, of 99 Orchard Street, represent a quite amazing and, I would say, violent procedure. The fact that it was requested by the uh, Lower East Side Museum has shocked a large part of the inhabitants of the district. 15 apartments of the building here in 99, uh, which was restored in the meanwhile, were rented to 15 families, and in its basement here is located one of the most well-known Chinese restaurants in the area, employer of Chinese, recent Chinese emigrants uh, in the neighborhood. So newspapers made a lot of noise about this, um, this story here, highlighting a kind of paradoxical situation, opposing, on the one hand, the Lower East Side Museum, and on the other hand, the owner of the 99 Orchard Street, the Jewish ancestor of whom uh, settled down in this building in 1910, and also opposing to the Chinese uh, owners of the, uh, of the restaurant. Well, the conflict divided, to make a long story short, the conflict divided the shopkeepers and the residents into two fractions, pro and against the museum. 
the owner of number 99, accused the museum to disnify the district. The museum, in its turn, accused the owner of 99 to be an active agent of gentrification, asserting that he was renting the apartments of uh, 99 building uh, here to affluent tenants paying astronomical rents and coming from outside the area. Actually, whatever the arguments of the owner of 99 Orchard Street are, it is clear that the families who live here today in the 99 uh, have little in common with emigrants that, uh, who were hosted here in the 19th century or the first uh, half of the 20th century. Nowadays, the very carefully restored tenement at 99 uh, Street welcomes new gentrifiers. And they come to this district, among other reasons, thanks to the fact that the Tenement Museum, located nearby, located next door in fact, gave to this building here, to the 99, a new symbolic value and also a new economic value. This conflict, I think, is intrinsically linked, related to the social context of the neighborhood and the Lower East Side Museum is both the symptom and the co-producer, in fact, of this social context and this social, in fact, conflict. Well, the conflict was analyzed, <coughs> sorry, uh, in quite ambivalent way by researchers who, in fact, have worked in this neighborhood. And I will quote here, um, I will quote here uh, the sociologist uh, Christopher uh, Mele, uh, author of the book with the very evocative title, Selling the Lower East Side, who believes that it's easy to sympathize um, with the two sides. So the question is, which view of the Lower East Side do you embrace? Is this area a gold mine of emigrant history that should be preserved? Or is it a living, uh, breathtaking place filled with new and older emigrants who should be protected? The Lower East Side, the Lower East Side area, is indeed one of the most symbolic neighborhoods of New York. And I quote here two short words, um, sentences, um, which I think represent this value of, uh, this, uh, of this neighborhood. Uh, having failed finally to buy the 99 Orchard Street building, the Lower East Side Museum finally was able to buy the building located at 103 Orchard Street, uh, the building which is located here. The Lower East Side Museum is now the owner of four buildings in the vicinity of Orchard Street. In the building located here, in 103 Orchard Street, the museum opened new furnished apartments presenting the life of emigrants after 1935. The visitor center, which is here, uh, inaugurated uh, in 2011, occupies a total surface, the total surface of, this, of the ground floor. It clearly shows that the Lower East Side Museum is now the major cultural attraction of the neighborhood. More than an isolated attraction, the Lower East Side Museum became, uh, in a way, the, well, the gateway to uh, a, a whole district, to a whole neighborhood. Um, residential gentrification has to be put, and obviously all those issues here relate a lot with uh, residential and also commercial gentrification. Residential gentrification has to be put in relationship with a set of factors related to the metropolitan context of the area, means the very central location of the neighborhood, adjacent to areas having experienced strong phenomena of gentrification in the close past. I'm speaking here about areas like Soho, like Greenwich Village, etc. Uh, the existence also of a very active real estate market in one of the first global metropolis uh, such as uh, New York. Uh, according to researchers, uh, and I quote here Smith and Davis, uh, we identified three successive, in fact, waves of gentrification in the neighborhood. According to them, the uh, third wave of gentrification, which in fact began after 1994, uh, at the moment the museum opens uh, its apartments, has been the fiercest and the, the, the stronger. 
Also, the hypification, we could say, of the area followed up the gentrification of Orchard uh, Street, which became, in fact, in a way, the latest frontier for the young and groovy. Orchard Street became, in fact, the geographical center of the new gentrified area located south of Houston Street, nicknamed Boho by uh, the real estate developers, which in fact uh, was rather moderately affected by gentrification in the 1980s, 80s, means on the same time that other New York neighborhoods were really, I mean, experienced really uh, strong gentrification uh, phenomena. The gentrification of Orchard Street was in fact largely linked to the local culture, to the local art, and the local scene, in fact, of this uh, neighborhood. In this context, several projects of star architecture, star architecture, uh, confirmed the fact that the Lower East Side Museum was entering a kind of mature phase of gentrification. Uh, we can have here an example in this picture here of the buildings uh, which can be built through the transfer of building rights of other buildings. So a possibility in this globally protected area to build in some places buildings of more than 20 or 25 uh, stories. In 2007 was inaugurated also uh, at the Norfolk Avenue in the district, the blue condominium designed by the, the Swiss American architect, star architect we could say, Bernard Chumy. The opening also of the, um, uh, art, the, the, the Contemporary Art Museum at Bowery uh, Street in 2007 by Sana Architects, and also the Speron Moving Gallery by Norman Foster in 2010. I open a parenthesis here. Sana uh, Foster, uh, they are both, both agencies, uh, are uh, Pritzker uh, Prize winners. So, I mean, the equivalent of the uh, Nobel uh, Prize for Architecture. Both of them, uh, both places here, important um, cultural uh, places. And uh, those new, in fact, uh, cultural um, venues, openings, consolidated the cultural attractiveness of the neighborhood. According to newspapers, um, the Lower East Side is Manhattan's Cinderella uh, tale. Once it was touched by the magic wand of New York's Boho Conoscenti, this work-worn quarter began getting uh, gassed up for the board. Well, it is quite representative of the way this storytelling about the transformation of the neighborhood is produced. Tourism, in fact, developed quickly in this area, in this district. In 2004, it was inaugurated in, at the Rivington Street, at the the heart of the uh, neighborhood, the hotel on Rivington, uh, known as Thor. This very modern, very minimalist hotel contrasts sharply with the rest of the district. However, it is precisely the uh, Lower East Side neighborhood which serves as a decor for the hotel rooms, the walls of which are almost completely transparent. From the room windows, the Thor offers uh, those breathtaking view over the roofs of the Lower East Side neighborhood. Um, and in fact, following the construction of this first hotel, many other initiatives uh, took place in the area. I just present here the hotel, uh, the Blue Moon Hotel, which is located just in front of the tenement museum, the other way of the street, in a former tenement also, so, um, to elevate it and um, I will try to conclude and to discuss all those issues here quite briefly uh, and try to understand how all those um, issues of memory, of heritage, of gentrification, of tourism work together, in fact, and eventually reciprocally um, re uh, reproduce uh, each other. From this very brief analysis, it appears that the action of the Lower East Side Museum had an impact both on the heritageization, on the touristification, on the cultural development, and on the gentrification of the neighborhood. In terms of heritage, the action of the Lower East Side Museum was both direct and indirect. Direct, obviously, 
through the restoration and the interpretation of the buildings in 97 and 103 Orchard Street, but also by the actions taken by the managers of the museum aiming to preserve the uh, neighborhood as a whole. Indirect also because the actions of the museum resulted in showing differently the tenements, resulted in giving a new value to the tenement buildings. And by turning them, as I mentioned before, to semi of force, uh, to uh, mini carriers uh, of the history of immigration. The Lower East Side Museum also had a major cultural impact in the area and well beyond. It had an impact on cultural institutions, for example, of the city of New York by offering a new perspective for the city development, um, presenting and valorizing the uh, heritage of emigration. By proposing also programs involving local community and by developing links between the interpretative programs of the Lower East Side Museum and their geographical and demographic context, the area, the Lower East Side Museum challenged other much more classic museums and historical sites and invited them to re-examine their relationship to the city. The action of the Lower East Side Museum is also especially visible with regard to tourism development in the area. The museum today is clearly a major tourist attraction, uh, called in fact to further development in the years to come. For the Lower East Side Museum, memory activation irrefutably uh, involves the production of a tangible heritage. It's difficult to speak about memories without producing this tangible heritage that allows, in fact, the memory action to be developed. In this case, the Lower East Side Museum was undoubtedly a major agent of production of new heritages. The labeling of a Lower East Side Museum by the very prestigious National Park Service, the fact that a totally anonymous building, such as the one of 97 Orchard Street, uh, became a national uh, landmark is uh, very, um, very uh, important to underline. The stories and memories of the families of Gambidzis, of Baldinis, of the Levines, of the Rugratievskis, the Kofinos, etc., and the other families took out, uh, I would say, of anonymity the other residents of the tenements and contributed to turn into, to transform into heritage the places in which they lived. Here, the 97 Orchard Street, but more generally, in fact, any tenement museum. This heritageization action, based on modest, very modest traces, plays a particularly central role in the area, which, in fact, as I mentioned before, lacks major uh, monuments. The new populations of hipsters, attracted by the district, are very sensitive to this heritage, which would have probably did not exist without the action of social activists and also of the researchers of the Lower East Side Museum. Historians, sociologists, anthropologists, anthro um, ethnologists, etc., etc., who wrote, in a way, the storytelling of the heritageization of the area. However, this raw material for heritageization, largely produced by the action of the Lower East Side Museum, is directly or indirectly commoditized by the real estate market. The commercial arguments of realtors, whose role is, of course, to create new desires, desire to live, to invest, to work, to visit, to buy in the area, uses heritage as one of the major market arguments. Gentrification in the Lower East Side Museum would not have the impact it had during the early 2000, uh, the, the decade of 2000, without creating previously a particularly efficient discourse, a particularly efficient storytelling, characterizing, describing, and documenting the urban landscape in which gentrification took place afterwards. The parallel done before with Cinderella, the Cinderella tale, which is recurrent, in fact, in the success stories of cities or neighborhoods 
that came back in a way, came back here to the real estate market, allows to insist on the radical character of this urban transformation. So the action of the Lower East Side Museum uh, is also related because we have to see it, in fact, both ways. On the other side, the action of the uh, Lower East Side Museum, uh, the cultural, educational, social, and also touristic action of the museum is facilitated by its location in a neighborhood such as Lower East Side uh, today, uh, because in fact, contemporary immigration in New York today does not happen anymore in the Lower East Side. Normally, an immigration museum should be located at Queens, at Bronx, in the neighborhoods which really receive uh, immigration today. But only in a central area characterized by this very sophisticated cultural, commercial, and, uh, and, and accommodation mix I presented before can offer, in fact, to Lower East Side Museum a large touristic uh, audience. In this sense, heritageization is appealing for the gentrifiers the same way that gentrification in, is interesting for heritage promoters. This kind of gentrification, heritageization game, which is underway in a neighborhood like Lower East Side, is expressed as a permanent negotiation to which participate the different actors according to their interests, uh, which are ultimately complementary. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We're going to have time for two questions, Max. No? Okay, well. Yes. Okay, so about the example you explained, um, the Lower Side uh, Museum, I wonder what difficulties could the museum have to be integrated in the community? Because like, I guess it's difficult because the, um, the suggestion was, wasn't fully accepted for the population, for the local population. So what, what can the museum do to be more accepted in, in this sense? Well, the, the museum here does really great work with the neighborhood. The conflict I spoke about was quite localized, and it was localized uh, around this possibility of buying a living tenement, which was quite absurd. In normal terms, and from its beginning, Lower East Side Museum is doing a great work with the neighborhood, working with uh, people uh, in the area. Uh, many of them uh, volunteer to the museum, so many of the volunteers of the museum are people from the area. And also, which is very interesting, I didn't have the time to speak about this, the museum works really as uh, the interpretation gate for the area. It means that obviously they speak a lot about the families who lived inside the museum, but those histories, I mean, yeah, sorry. Those histories, in fact, relate more generally to uh, all uh, New York immigration and further related to all Americans. I mean, when American people visit this museum, all of them, all of them, they have a history which is related to the families, uh, be they uh, Irish, um, German, um, Mediterranean or whatever. So there is this kind of relation. And which is interesting is all this work which is done by the museum to open up to the neighborhood with a lot of uh, visits of the neighborhood, in fact. Thank you. One more question. I just wanted to ask very, very, very briefly. Um, we have seen with the Royal Academy of Arts, it had like a very, um, uh, a very, yeah. See. Very sophisticated origins, and it's trying to open to the public with this. Uh, with this new conference hall, etc., 
And with the, with the uh, case that uh, Madame Gabriel Barba is explaining, it has like a more popular origin and it's gentrificating. So it's like kind of opposite origins and opposite results. So could you tell us more about why or how, how this evolution is going to be? I, I mean, the academy is a complicated institution because in some ways it's a very old-fashioned elite institution of a small number of academicians. a bit like the academy, I think, is in Madrid. But on the other hand, because it's a Kunsthalle, it's had this tradition all through the 20th century of attracting big mass audiences. So the, when I arrived, there was this tension between the small-scale, rather old-fashioned, traditional club aspect of the institution and a public which came, but came not in order to see, the, to see or understand the institution. So what I would like to think we've done is to democratize the experience of the institution as a whole, exhibitions, teaching, and the academy, to make the academy into a more plural and eclectic institution. But it still is different. Attention in the project was that it was in Mayfair. And Mayfair is not a very democratic part of the city. No, you know, it's, a, it's not the Lower East Side. It's, it's the Upper East Side. And, and that was tricky because a lot of the funding was tied to do with getting in new audiences. It has got about an extra 500,000 visitors this last nine months. But I'm not going to pretend that those 500,000 are very socially diverse or mixed. I would like to. It, it has changed to an extent, but it is not like the audience is not like local museums. Thank you very much. And uh, we can continue with the program.